welcome everyone here tonight and those that are viewing by way of YouTube. We uh, certainly welcome you and uh, trust that what we have to say tonight will be a source of inspiration and blessing to you. I've given you a handout tonight and what I want to begin talking about, this may be a little series, a uh, mini-series, we want to just simply talk about beyond words and thoughts. You know, I think we have been almost bamboozled and hoodwinked by the fact that we have to say certain words. Uh, many times we have been taught that our thoughts have power and that it's all in the thoughts. And a lot of people will quote the scripture that says, as a man thinketh, so is he. Well, it really doesn't say that. They misquote that many times. In fact, I heard someone on TV quoting that scripture just today. And they stopped after, as a man thinketh, so is he. As a man thinketh, they stopped right there. Rather than adding the rest of the words, as a man thinketh in his heart, and of course the heart is synonymous with the awareness and with the consciousness. And so they were teaching uh, the fact that however you think, that is going to be your experience. They just didn't take it far enough. Now, we were all taught that, that it's all in confession and it's all in our thoughts. And uh, many times, if we made a wrong confession, it would minister fear to us. Or if we were thinking, uh, were thinking thoughts that were maybe not totally in line with the Word of God, it would minister fear as well. And so I think we need to realize that we must get beyond just the confession of the Word, because how many know you can confess the Word and it's still not be in your heart? Mm -hmm. You can just confess it because <laughs> you know that that's the truth, you know that's found in your Bible, you're confessing it maybe just from the memory bank, from memorizing certain scriptures. But what I want to show you in this little series is that unless we can get into the consciousness, unless we can get the word into the heart, quickened in the heart. Now, we know the word is already in our heart. The scripture says in Jeremiah and the book of Hebrews, he's written his word upon our heart and upon our mind. And that means that within our heart is the word already. In our mind is the word. In other words, our mind is the mind of Christ. So we have the mind of Christ. The word has been written upon our heart. So why do we have to get the word in our heart? Simply so it can be quickened there. The word can be in our heart, but not be a reality, not be quick in there, not be alive there so that we can walk in and, and experience it. So, you know, just as Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, he said, you cannot add one cubit to your stature by thought. That's what he said. He said, take no thought for what you eat, drink, or wear. And then later on he said, you cannot add one cubit to your stature, meaning you can't change one thing just with your thoughts just by thinking positive thoughts. You see, many times we have taught that our thoughts have power and we haven't realized that that can just be mind over matter or positive thinking. And we know that Zechariah said in chapter 4 and verse 6, it is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit. And if you look up the word spirit in the Greek, it's the same word as consciousness. So in other words, it has to get a little bit deeper than just positive thinking or mind over matter, or renewing the mind as we have taught. I've shared with you how that it's not even about renewing the mind because when you read that scripture in Romans 12 and verse 2 where it says, not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, the words of and your are not really in the Greek. So what it's saying is you can experience our Father simply by putting on the renewing mind. Not renewing your mind. I don't have a mind to renew, and certainly we can't renew the mind of Christ. It doesn't need any renewing. And so therefore, we've got to see that all things come out of consciousness. All things come out of spirit. The power is not just on the thoughts, but the power is on the heart, or the power is on the consciousness. The power is on spirit, or the power is on our awareness. And so once we see that our thoughts are merely an agency or a vehicle to awareness, then we can see the difference there. You see, our physical bodies have been given to us of God as a vehicle of expression. Same way with our thoughts. We have the thoughts of God and they are a vehicle to awareness or a vehicle to our consciousness. And then out of the consciousness, as it says in Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6, it is not by might, not by mental might, not by physical or material power, but by my spirit, as I said, which is synonymous with consciousness. So it's not by might. It's not just positive thinking or mind over matter or renewing the mind. 
It's not by power. It's not by physical, material power. It's not by our decreeing and resisting and denying and binding and loosing and declaring and affirming. It's not by that. He said, it is by my spirit or by consciousness, saith the Lord of hosts. That's Zechariah chapter 4 and verse 6. So what I want to do tonight is just begin to share with you that when we really begin to understand the nature of God and the nature of error, when I say error, I mean sin, sickness, death, and poverty, when we understand the nature of our Father, and when we understand the nature of error, <clears throat> then we will automatically, spontaneously, just kind of fall in line and understand the nature of prayer. So what I want to do is give you <laughs> ten principles of truth that will begin to establish you in the nature of God. And I just want to look at these. I've given you a handout that has all of them there. I didn't write everything out there or type everything out. So I'll probably add some things as we go through these ten principles of truth to show you, number one, the nature of God. Let me say this again. When you understand the nature of God and you're established in the understanding of the nature of God and the nature of error, then you will naturally be established in the nature of prayer. You'll come to understand what prayer is and you'll come to understand what prayer is not. So, number one, if you look at your handout there, the first one that I have there, and these are so vitally important, again, just talking about the nature of God, spiritual life is an inner experience. No matter what mode or what method is used, that experience is possible based upon our motive to know Him and to discover truth, to have truth revealed. So in other words, the first one there is the motive is not a bunch of natural means and modes and methods, but the motive to experience our Father. And remember, He's on the inside of us. He's not out there. He's not on some planet called heaven. He's nearer than our breath, closer than hands and feet. He is our very life. So when we talk about God, when we talk about Christ, when we talk about the Father, we're not talking about some entity on the outside of us. We're talking about he who abides on the inside of us. We're talking about he that we are one with. So as it says there, number one, spiritual life is an inner experience. And when the motive is to experience and have truth revealed, to know him aright, and to experience him, you see, then we can begin to really make some strides in our experience with the Father. You know, uh, Simon, I believe it was in the book of Acts, he saw the miracles and the signs and the wonders, and he wanted to buy the gift of God. A lot of people today still are trying to buy the gift of God. See, as long as a person just wants to know the Word to demonstrate health, to demonstrate prosperity, to demonstrate something in an outer sense, it will not happen. Now, I know the Scripture tells us that these signs shall follow those that believe, but what is our motive tonight? If our motive is to experience Him and Him alone and know Him aright, not to demonstrate healing or health or signs and wonders, then we're going to begin to experience Him. I believe signs and wonders and so forth will automatically happen, but you see, so many people in ministry today want to wow people. And they want to wow people by, you know, being able to lay hands on people and seeing the blinded eyes open and the deaf ears unstopped and to see people, you know, people that maybe have been uh, paralyzed, to see them walk. And they really, really believe that ministry is just to do that. Well, when Jesus said, these things shall you do and greater, he was not talking about opening a blinded eye physically, opening a deaf ear physically, or causing a person that's paralyzed to walk physically. The greater works, I believe, are to lift people, minister a word that lifts people out of the whole realm of death, and then all of those things will naturally begin to follow. Signs and wonders and so forth will naturally follow the ministering of the Word of God and will lift people out of the whole realm of death to where they realize their oneness in Him to where they then experience fruit that remains. They're not healed one day and sick the next or prosperous one day and, and the next day they can't pay their bills. It's not about that. They will begin to experience fruit that remains in every dimension in every area of their life. See, we've had the cart before the horse for so many years. We've tried to demonstrate God. We've tried to wow people. 
we wanted people to see, you know, that our God is the real God, or we wanted to, you know, make people think that we are the anointed woman or the anointed man of God, and we've had the cart before the horse. Once we really desire to experience him just for the sake of experiencing him, then all those other things will begin to fall in line. So number one, the first one is spiritual life is an inner experience. And no matter what mode or method is used to try to experience the dimension of God, we must realize that our motive has got to be to know him in and of itself, to just simply know him aright, to have that experience of intimacy between us and the Father. And until we are at that place and nothing else matters in ministry, it's just going to be fruit today and gone tomorrow. It's not going to be something consistent. You know, the Bible talks about the valleys brought up and the mountains brought down. What does that talk about? It's talking about a leveling and an evening in a people's lives. So number one, if our motive is just to know him, period, then we're going to begin to experience him like we have never experienced him before. Number two, no matter how intelligent a person is, that will not bring spiritual experience. You could have a whole alphabet suit behind your name, P-H-D, D-D-D, matters not. It has nothing to do with our intelligence. We have got to actually die completely to the outer realm in order to really experience our Father. You see, there is no God in the human world. If there was a God, now don't misunderstand, God is omnipresent. He's everywhere present. But how many know he said, that he is not, my kingdom is not of this world. Right. So in other words, if God was the God of the human world, would we have wars and would we have pestilence and would we have the Ebola epidemic? Would we have all of those things? Nope. Absolutely not, you see. There'd be no wars. There'd be no disease. If we could just think of how it was before Adam partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, how was it? He was placed in a finished work. He was placed in a perfect environment with a perfect heredity. There was only God and nothing else. Any need that came up in Adam's life wasn't really a need to him because he lived out of the isness of God. He just naturally lived out of the isness of God. As I said last week, you know, birds aren't aware of the air and fish aren't aware of the water. They just fly and swim. You see, and so Adam, before he partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, he just lived out of the nowness of God, the isness of God, the uh -huh. asness of God. And you see, the scripture says in Genesis chapter 1, in the beginning, God. Yeah. In the beginning, God. So if we would look back and if we could just see how it was before Adam partook of yeah. the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, there was only God and nothing else. And he just naturally lived out of that. And so that's so important for us to understand that the isness of God and the nowness of God, if we can just live out of the isness and the nowness of God, we could live yeah. exactly the way Adam was created to live in the beginning. So, as I said, there is no God in the human world. Otherwise, there'd be no wars, there'd be no pestilence, there'd be nothing of that sort out in our world. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. And then he told the disciples, he said, you're in the world, but you're not of the world. In the world, but not of the world. So number two, my point is this. You don't have to have a PhD or a DDD. You don't have to have a high IQ. You don't have to have a whole alphabet suit behind their name. One guy says a PhD is a Pentecostal hairdo. You don't have to have a Pentecostal hairdo either. Don't have to have any of that, you see, to understand the Bible. Because what? It's spiritually understood and spiritually discerned. There, there's nothing, you know. You know, I know people who have a, a, a great relationship with the Father and communion and fellowship, and they're illiterate, can't even read. Yeah. Yeah. I, I have a man in my church in Portland that has a very close relationship with the Father, and he's been illiterate all of his life can't even read. So it's not based upon our intelligence, how smart we are. Of course, there's no premium on being dumb either, but let me just say, it's by the Spirit. It is by the Spirit. We are Spirit-taught, Spirit-led. All we have to do is acknowledge Him in all of our ways, and He'll direct our paths. He'll reveal Himself unto us. So, number one, the first one we looked at there has to do with motive. 
Number two has to do with intelligence. We don't have to be highly intelligent to understand the things of the Spirit. I heard a man years ago that's on national television today. He said, the thing you spend most of your time on is what you're going to depend on. So if you spent many, many years in Bible college, mm -hmm. studying the scriptures, learning eschatology, and all of the historical events of the Bible, if you spent many, many years doing that, that's what you're going to depend upon. But you see, we depend upon the Holy Spirit to reveal and to quicken his word to us. Number three, the third thing is, and this is hard many times for people to understand, especially what we have come out of in the faith realm teaching that you got to name it and claim it, you know, and as some say, blab it and grab it. We have been so hoodwinked and bamboozled thinking that we've got to confess it just right and say it just right and think it just right. And I've shared with you how that years ago when people in my church, my congregation would come up to me and want me to pray for them concerning healing or prosperity in their life, I'd lay hands on them and immediately start to confess all the scriptures that I could think of. But you see, it was just coming out of my memory bank. It was not by spirit, it was by might and power rather than by my spirit, saith the Lord, as Zechariah 4, 6 says. And one day the Lord said, I, I just want you to hush. <laughs> just be silent and just wait upon me. Don't be afraid of the silence and let the still small voice speak within you. And then when the still small voice speaks and is raised up within you, then if you're so inclined spiritually, utter those words. Because when he utters his voice, the earth melts, as it says in yeah. the book of Psalms. And so number three is this. We do not go to God for a God power or to do anything. We go to God within to commune, to tabernacle with him, to experience him. Because any time that we're asking him to do something out <laughs> here, we're setting up a sense of separation. Someone says, now how... Could I set up a sense of separation if I'm asking God to do something for me or to bring about a manifestation? Well, first of all, when Jesus went to the cross of Calvary, it says that he went there for this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the enemy. Sin, sickness, death, poverty was rendered powerless. So the reason we don't have to go to God for a God power to do something is simply because there's nothing that has to be done. We just need to wake up to the fact that he finished it at the cross. He put us in a perfect environment with a perfect heredity. So we don't need to get a greater power, which is God's power, to overcome what we consider to be a lesser power. What we need to do is simply realize there's only one power. There's only one presence. There's only one mind. Now, I know religion hasn't taught us that because they've taught us there's, you know, a more than one presence and more than one power, the power of sin, sickness, death, the devil, and Satan, and all of that. But Jesus eradicated that at the cross of Calvary. And so now, since the death, burial, and resurrection, there's really only one reality, one power, one presence, and one mind. And so we have been taught that we've got to go to God to get this greater power to overcome what we consider to be a lesser power and what we do is we set up a sense of separation because everything that we think we have need of every apparent need that we have in our life we already are that he is that as us see he is all in all and all y'all that's what the scripture says he is all in all he not only made provision but he placed that provision on the inside of us and so if it's health that you need if it's finances that you need you simply need to realize, as Matthew 6, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all of these things that you have an apparent need of will be added, attracted, or just unfolded because it is who he is in you, through you, and as you. As he is, so are you in this world. So if as he is, so are we, then that means that we have no need of anything. Oh, we can have an apparent need of things, but we need to realize, instead of asking God for those things, we need to realize He is that on the inside of me right now. And all I have to do is live out of the nowness of who He is as me. Because He is all of those things that we think we have need of. Whoa. See, and that's why David could say, The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Even back in the Old Covenant, he realized that the Lord God was everything he had wow. need of. And even though at that time maybe God was more or less just with them, now he's in us, and, a, and in a greater sense, everything we think we have need of, he is that in us and as us. 
See, because that's double-minded to think I've got to ask God for this, that, and the other when he already is that in me. And what that does is set up a sense of separation, you see. We are one in him. God is indivisible. God, we are one. We are as one with our Father. We are one in Christ Jesus tonight. Nothing or no one can separate us, the Bible says in Romans chapter 8. We're so one in him. So number three, we don't go to God for a God power to get a greater power to overcome a lesser power. We go to God, you see, to commune within. See, one of the meanings of where it says, seek ye first the kingdom of God in Matthew 6, Seek means to worship. It's not like we're seeking, where are you, God? No, we know he's right uh -huh. here. Closer than our breath, nearer than hands and feet. So it means to worship. It means to draw. Seek means to draw within to live from the inside out rather than from the outside in. So we don't go to God for a God power to do anything whatsoever. That's number three. Number four, all religions teach, and this is another big one, all religions teach that God is a God that rewards and punishes. So we need to be good so we get rewarded, is what religion teaches, and we need to shun being bad or shun the evil so that we don't get the wrath of God or the judgment of God or the punishment of God. And what they fail to realize is that they set themselves in motion the law of sowing and reaping. That's what we need to understand. God is the law of our being. We are one with him. And it's not God that rewards. See, he is our reward already. And we were punished at the cross of Calvary and judged over 2,000 years ago. His judgment was our judgment. We're not looking for any judgment to come. People say, well, if God doesn't judge America, he's going to apologize to Sodom and Gomorrah. Honey, he judged America and the whole world over 2014 years ago. His judgment was our judgment. His crucifixion was our crucifixion. His death was our death. His burial was our burial. His quickening, raising, and seeding was our quickening, raising, and seeding. He did that. As us. It says, he who knew no sin became who we were, became sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. So you see, God is not rewarding and punishing. You could not be good enough for God to reward you or bad enough for him to punish you. <laughs> so it's not about that. It's just simply that the church has failed to realize that we set in motion that law of sowing and reaping. Now, what I want to talk about a little bit is what does it mean to really sow to the Spirit? Now, to sow to the Spirit would mean a number of things on a couple of different levels. To sow to the Spirit, number one, would be that I acknowledge the death, the burial, and the resurrection and what that did and what that means to me. Number two, to sow to the Spirit means that I realize that He is the source of everything within my life. He is the source. When I acknowledge the Lord in all of my ways, then what happens is the law of the spirit of life naturally begins to flow. Divine law begins to flow. Divine grace begins to flow. Divine presence begins to flow. The divine activity of the God of my being begins to flow. In fact, Proverbs 3 and 8 is the scripture that I've quoted several times already tonight where it says, in all of thy ways, not in a few, in all of thy ways acknowledge me, and where do we acknowledge him? That we're one with him. Yeah. And then it says, he shall direct all of our paths. When we acknowledge him in all of our ways and everything that we do, he shall direct our paths. Now, I made a statement a couple weeks ago that I want to go back and just kind of add a little bit to. I was driving down the road going to the church that I pastor in Portland a few weeks back. Mm -hmm. And I heard the spirit raise up within me and say, you're not in the car, the car is in you. Mm -hmm. And then he said, when you go in a plane, you're not in the plane, the plane's in you. And then he said, your body, you're not in your body, your body's in you. And so I began to meditate upon that. Lord, what exactly are you saying to me? And this is what he began to explain to me. When we get in our car, when we acknowledge him in all of our ways, even getting in our car, and that only takes a second, Lord, I thank you, you are my safety, you are my protection. Mm -hmm. Acknowledging him in all of our ways. Then you see, that conscious awareness will what? Direct all our paths. Yeah. And he is then our safety in our experience. And he is our protection in our experience. So you see, who's driving the car then? The car's not taking me down to Portland automatically and naturally. Consciousness. Mm -hmm. Out of my consciousness. He is. 
the safety, and the protection. I get in a plane, the same thing is true. When I acknowledge him in getting in that plane, Lord, I just thank you that you are my safety. Yeah. You're not going to bring me safety. You are that in me, through me, and as me. Mm -hmm. And then what happens is safety and protection is just there naturally. Now, in our body, what about the body? <clears throat> when he said, you're not in your body, your body is in you. He began to explain that, and he used the scripture there in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. In other words, my life is not sustained only if every organ in my body is working properly. My life is sustained by consciousness. My life is sustained by the awareness that I have of my oneness in Him. I could have an organ, any one of us tonight could have an organ that's failing tonight. And guess what? That is not what sustains our life. Now, for a lot of people, it is because their trust is in material, you see. Their trust is in the outer realm. But when our trust is in the God within us that we are one with, and we know that He is our all in all, and we live from the inside out, and we acknowledge Him in all of our ways, in our getting in our car, getting in a plane, in our body, in every area of our life, when we acknowledge Him in all of our ways, then consciousness ensues. Safety is there naturally. Protection is there naturally. And I'm not dependent on the outer realm. In my body, I'm not dependent on whether my heart, my kidneys, my lizard, my gizzard is working properly. I'm dependent upon consciousness that I'm one with. See, I put on the mind of Christ in those areas. And so that is what is guiding. See, acknowledge him in all your ways. And he within will direct thy paths and so forth. Now, I understand that when we have some situations in the outer realm, when we acknowledge him, let's say you have some sickness in your body, Listen, when you acknowledge him and you begin to live from the inside out, all of those things can just naturally dissolve. Yeah. And, you know, someone asked me, well, what happens when that takes place? Well, if you went into a dark room and you flipped on the light, let me ask you the question, where does the darkness go? Mm. Well, it goes nowhere. Why? It's a no thing. In Isaiah chapter 40, he said the realm of man, which includes sin, sickness, death, poverty, anything you can think of, he said it's nothing. It's less than nothing. Remember when the armies were coming against Israel and Israel was way outnumbered by the armies and they were scared to death and the men went to Hezekiah and said, you know, what's going to happen to us? We're outnumbered. We're going to be slaughtered. Hezekiah goes to the Lord and comes back with the answer and the Lord said, it is nothing but an arm of flesh. Mm -hmm. And what did it do? It dissolved all of Israel's fear. Yeah. All of the men on the battlefield, it dissolved their fear. And you know what? They didn't even have to fight. The enemies fought against one another, and all they did after the war was over is go out and pick up all the spoils. They got mighty rich over that. You see? And the same way with us. Where does sin, sickness, and death, and poverty, where does it go? Well, it's dissolved. Yes, a pain may leave, you know, a lump may dissolve and so forth, but it really goes nowhere as we realize it's really a no thing because of what Jesus did to it at the cross of Calvary. So the thing we need to do is just begin to live from the inside out and realize it's not by mental might. It's not by mind over matter. It's not by our thoughts. It's not by quoting scripture, scriptures out of our, our memory bank. It is not by positive thinking. It's not by renewing the mind. It's about putting on the mind of Christ, but not renewing your mind because you don't really have a mind to renew. You got rid of that mind when Jesus uh, went to the cross, yeah. and all you have is the mind of Christ. Yeah. So Paul said, put on the mind of Christ. Not renewing your mind. It's putting on the mind of Christ. And that's what it means to live yep. from the inside out. Mm -hmm. Now, number three. Four was what? All religions teach that God rewards and God punishes. So people seek to be good rather than living from the inside out. They seek to be good so they get rewarded when he already is their reward. They seek to shun evil so they don't get punished when he's already punished is at the cross of Calvary. The old man was punished for what he did. His judgment was our judgment. And so what is this talking about? It's talking about the fact that we need to realize that we, God is the law of our being now, we have the dominion, not over something, but to live in paradise or to live in this dimension of spirit. And so as we live from the inside out, it just naturally begins to take place within our lives. We begin to experience him, you see, as our reward. And we begin to realize that we are the ones that set in motion either the law of Sowing to the flesh or the law of sowing to the spirit. Mm -hmm. So to sow to the spirit again means I look at every appearance realm or suggestion that comes and tries to tempt me. I look at it through what Jesus did to it Amen. at the cross of Calvary yeah. over 2,000 years ago. And I see then when I really realize that he 
got rid of that, sin, sickness, death, poverty, whatever it is, when I really realized that he rendered it powerless, that's what the scripture says, he rendered it idle, inoperative, unemployed, the scripture says, and when we realize that, then we can really hone in on the fact that, listen, there's only one power, only one presence, only one mind, and as I acknowledge him in all of my ways, then all things are going to be attracted or unfolded from me wow. just naturally. And then it's going to be fruit that remains. It's not going to be here today and gone tomorrow. That's the good news of the gospel. Number five. Number five is this. The mind or thoughts must rest. Jesus said again in Matthew 6, You cannot, by taking thought, add one cubit to your stature, meaning... Just by your thoughts, positive thinking, mind over matter, you can't change a thing. And then he said, take no thought for food, drink, or clothing. So you see, we've got to move beyond just the thoughts. We've got to move beyond just the thoughts and realize that the thoughts are just a vehicle or an agency to awareness, to where it gets quickened in us by the Spirit. Then you're dealing with consciousness. Then you're dealing with quickening. Then you're dealing with awareness. Not just something that you're confessing off of the top of your head. That's just in the realm of thought. As our, as our body is a vehicle of expression, so our thoughts, you see, are a vehicle or an agency to awareness. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 6, it tells us there that the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. Now, the letter there can just be, and, and of course I minister principles all the time, but listen, if we stop at principles only, that's just the letter. If we stop <laughs> at just thinking the right thoughts, even if they're scriptural thoughts, if we stop there, then that's still the letter, and the letter killeth. But when it's quickened, you see, the letter killeth, but the spirit giveth life. So mind over matter, positive thinking, renewing the mind as we used to teach, and I taught it for over 30 years. What is that? That can kill. That doesn't give life. Until the Holy Spirit within us quickens those thoughts. Oh, yes. And when they're quickened, you see, they're really in our awareness and they are really in Amen. our consciousness. Yeah. No one can reach God through mere knowledge. Quoting scripture won't do it. One must have discernment. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says, The natural man, because the natural man is the man that is just thinking out of a carnal reasoning or a natural mind. It says the natural man cannot receive the things of the Spirit, their foolishness unto him. It says they have to be spiritually discerned or spiritually ascertained or spiritually received. In other words, what it's saying there in 1 Corinthians 2.14, the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit. We have to go just beyond <coughs> natural thinking. And you can have just natural thinking out of your memory bank just because you memorized a bunch of scriptures. I know a man tonight, they say, he's on television, very popular man, and uh, no need to mention any names because we're not trying to criticize anyone, but I hear that he has memorized the Bible from Genesis to Revelation. And to sit under that ministry, let me tell you, it is dead as a doornail. There's no life. It's in his memory bank. And he can quote scriptures left and right, but you see, there's no life to listen to that ministry simply because... It has not been yeah. quickened to him. It has not become quickened, made alive by the Holy Spirit so that he could walk in it and experience Now, I'm not judging the man. I'm just telling you that I've heard that he has memorized the Bible. And I've listened to him on numerous occasions, and there is nothing of life there. It's all dead letter. It's all legalism. It's all eschatology. It's all about what's happening out here. None of it is about what is happening on the inside of a people. Yeah. Now, another scripture that we have is Romans chapter 8 and verse 7. And it says there that the natural man, or to be carnally minded, you cannot be subject to the law of God. Neither indeed can you ever be subject to the law of God. In other words, just through thoughts. Just through thoughts. Just through natural thoughts, even if they're verses of scripture, <coughs> will not get the divine law of God, the law of the spirit of life, flowing in our lives. There's got to be that ministration of the Holy Spirit that is quickened it and made it alive on the inside of us. Because the natural man can only function through his natural mind 
through thoughts. The natural man many, many times has tried to reach God and the natural man will never be able to reach God because listen, it's not about us reaching God. Yeah. It's about God reaching us. Amen. Let me say that again. The natural man has tried for many, many hundreds of years to reach yes. God. You'll never be able to reach God. It's God in us reaching us, revealing himself to us. Remember on the Tower of Babel, it said that God had to confuse the language because it said out of their thought, the imaginations, out of their natural thought, they were building this tower to reach heaven. They wanted to reach a spiritual experience from the outside by natural carnal means, natural thinking. And so the languages had to be confused. Otherwise, you know what? They probably would have been able to build that tower mighty high. And the thing of it is, do you know that that word there where it talks about uh, building that tower, the word tower in the Hebrew is pulpit? Oh. <laughs> it's pulpit. So you see, there's a whole lot of uh, preaching from the pulpit today about mind over matter and positive thinking, renewing the mind, not getting far enough into the awareness. See, everything that God created came out of what? God is spirit. Spirit is synonymous with consciousness. So it evolved out of God's consciousness. It says he created. What does create mean? It means to cut down for a formative process. Genesis chapter 1, he created. Genesis chapter 2, he formed the body. So what is that saying? Create to cut down in order to form something. So in other words, we came out of spirit. We were created out of spirit to this tangible level. See, because God wanted to be seen in the earth. So what are we? We are spirit slowed down to visibility. Because we came out of spirit. We came out of consciousness, you see. And so if we're going to, if I can use that word, create our world, it's going to be out of consciousness. Not out of mind over matter or positive thinking or renewing the mind. It's going to be out of that which has been quickened on the inside of us. Where deep calleth unto deep, you see. So that's an important thing for us to understand. Now, another scripture that's, uh, that we read that uh, I just love this scripture, and I just found it recently, and it connected it to what I'm wow. teaching, is found in Luke chapter 12 and verse 40, where it says, The Son of Man comes in an hour, listen, when you think not. The Son of Man cometh in an hour when you think not. Because the coming of the Son of Man, the coming of Christ, the evolving of Christ, in, through, and as us has nothing to do with mind over matter or natural thoughts or bringing even scriptures out of our memory bank. It has nothing to do with that. It has to do with the spirit. It has to do with the consciousness. So the Son of Man comes in an hour when you think not. And all we can do is just mainly be open for the unfoldment. And that's what it means where it says in Matthew 6, 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God, and all of these things that you have need of will be added. Now I've added another word there. All of these things will be unfolded because they're already within us. We lack nothing tonight. Mm -hmm. He is all in all. We lack absolutely nothing tonight. We are immortality personified in our bodies. He is, let me say it the right way, the correct way. He is the immortality of my body. Mm -hmm. He is the incorruptibility of my mind because I have the mind of Christ. He is the eternality of my spirit mm -hmm. in, through, and as me tonight. He is that, you see. Yeah. So we lack nothing tonight. And when we live out of the isness of God, which means what? Right now, He is everything we think we have need of. When we live out of the nowness, not tomorrow, because listen, tomorrow never comes. When tomorrow comes, it's now. Yesterday is past. So if we can live out of the nowness of God and the isness, that means I'm awake to the realization to right now, God is everything that I'll ever have need of from here on out to here on out. So you see, what has to take place is we just simply have to be open, open ourselves up for him to reveal himself for the spirit, for, for us to be <laughs> awakened to the spirit. You know, I remember years ago here in teaching, well, one day Christ is going to wake up within us. Well, he's never asleep in us. <laughs> he's never, spirit is never asleep in us. We're the ones that are waking up to the activity of spirit. Yeah. You see, we're the ones that have been asleep. And this is why all the way through the New Testament it talks about awake and wake up and be sober. Uh, Paul said it this way, awake to righteousness and sin not or don't have mistaken identity or don't have a sense of separation. That's what sin means in the New Covenant. See, Old Covenant, sin was what they did. Right. In the New Covenant, sin is missing the mark. It's mistaken identity. It's, it's not the little sins that people 
do out here. It's not that at all. Sin, awake to righteousness and sin not. Sin, there has two Greek words. One is harmatia, and it just means to miss the mark or to have a sense of, of separation is what it means. There's peritoma. Now, that's the sins of the flesh, you know, that Paul talked about. But, you see, we don't commit the sins of the flesh out here unless we first have the harmatia type of sin, the mistaken identity, and the sense of separation. That is what causes us to do things out here then, to sow to the flesh and get in trouble. But it starts on the inside. It starts with the harmatia sin, the, the, the mistaken identity, not knowing who he is in, through, and as us. Amen. See, because when we really know who he is and our oneness in him, I'll tell you what, all we want to do is just righteous all over the place. Amen. We just want to righteous all over the place. We, we do not want to get involved in works of the flesh or anything of that out there. Once we realize our oneness that we have in him and we know who he is in us, through us, and as us. So, number six. The next one is found in Romans chapter 10, 6 through 8. If we're looking up to God, wanting him to do something, or trying to get him to come down to us, we're missing it by a million miles. See, we must, we must be convinced that God does not reward good or punish evil. And the scripture here in Romans 10, 6 through 8 says, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. How many know some people are still trying to get him to come down and do something? And listen, he ain't going to do anything. He's done it all already, and now yes. he's the law of our being, and he says, now you. Right. Just like when Paul the Apostle Amen. had the thorn in the flesh, and he, he went to God. He said, God, will you remove this thorn? And the Lord said, no, Paul. My strength yes. is made perfect in weakness. As you yield the outer to the inner, as you allow the outer part, the feminine principle of your being, to be conceived by the masculine principle of your being, Amen. as you'll just yield, just rest and realize, you see, then you won't even give a hoot about that thorn in the flesh. Mm -hmm. You know, you'll be agreeing with your adversary, and then it'll just naturally be swallowed up. So he was saying, and God was saying, I'm not going to do it for you, Paul. You've got the mind of Christ, the faith of the Son of God. You have the revelation of the death, the burial, the resurrection. You have everything. You lack nothing. You just yield and rest and realize, and that thorn won't <laughs> bother you whatsoever. And then Paul finally got to the place in the book of Philippians. He said, in whatsoever state I find myself in, I'm content therewith. Amen. And what does content mean? I'm totally unaffected by anything that's going on on the outside. When we get to that place, by living from the inside out, I'll guarantee you, you won't care about this, that, or the other. You'll be agreeing with your adversary, which means have a healthy mind, put on the mind of Christ about that which tempts you or something in the appearance realm that makes a suggestion to you to try to bring you down or depress you. You won't care about it because you'll be so living from the inside out. And you'll turn around, all of a sudden you'll realize that thing, whatever it was, is just gone. Amen. You may go days and not even realize yeah. that that thing has been gone, you see. But you see, we have been taught in the body. We've got to decree, we've got to declare, we've got to resist, we've got to bind, we've got to loose, we've got to uh, declare, we've got to affirm, we've got to do all this stuff. Ain't nothing you got to do. Pardon my improper English, but there ain't nothing you have to do except rest and realize. Not rest and be passive. But rest and realize there's only one power, only one presence, and only one mind. Mm. We must rest and realize what Jesus did when he went to the cross of Calvary. Yeah. What did he do? He mm. rendered everything that would oppose us in the realm of appearance. He rendered it powerless. Mm. So Romans 10, 6 through 8, Who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall ascend into the deep? That is to bring him up again from the dead. Now listen, but what saith it? Here's the answer. The word is nigh thee, even in thy mouth and in thy heart. Consciousness. So you see, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. As a man thinketh in his heart or consciousness, so is he. So I'm not saying that we don't speak words, but let it come out of our consciousness rather than the top of our head. That's all I'm saying about that. And we have been so bamboozled in religion. Oh, just speak the word, speak the word, sister. Speak the word, speak the word. You can say I'm healed all day long. And that doesn't make it so. Amen. You can be sick or a dog. You can say I'm rich, I'm rich, I'm rich all day long. And that doesn't make it so. You can be poor as a church mouse, whatever that is. <laughs> right? That doesn't do it. That does not make it so. The, re the reality, the consciousness.
consciousness, the awareness, the quickening is what makes it so. When you know in your heart, Amen. beyond the shadow of a doubt, he is my wealth. He is my food. He is all in all. Then you can begin to experience it. So number six, if we're looking for God to come down here to do something or to bring up from somewhere to do something, we're missing it a million miles. We need to realize. See, have you ever wondered why good people suffer? And it seems like evil people prosper? Well, I've given you the answer already. It's because people in the church that are good people, well-meaning people, have been filled with a whole lot of religiosity. And they know nothing about They're always wanting God to come and do something. And they're always trying to get a greater power to overcome what they consider to be a lesser power. And it's not working for them. And let me tell you, the church is at the place Amen. where they're realizing something is not too kosher about all the stuff we've been taught. Now, we've been taught some good things, but you know what? When Adam partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it says their eyes were open. Mm -hmm. What do you mean their eyes were open? Mm -hmm. What happened was their carnal eyes were open, their spiritual eyes flipped backwards, and we've seen the opposite ever since then. And religion has taught us a lie for the most part. Not everything, but a lot. 99% of the things I was taught in religiosity, I could just go the opposite direction and find the truth. Hello. And I'm not upset. I'm not mad at religion. You know, I don't love it, but I certainly don't hate it. I use it as a stepping stone, you see, because if, if I was not involved in religion, what I'm sharing with you concerning all of the religiosity, it would just be a textbook. Mm -hmm. it, it wouldn't be something that I experienced, but I was raised in a very legalistic church, so I can speak uh, about that with some, you know, with some understanding, having gone through that and experienced that. Mm -hmm. So I don't hate religion, because anything you hate, you give a power to, and I certainly don't love it, but I'm neutral about religion. See, because I'm not going to give it a power. We don't have to give it a power because Jesus nailed it to the cross. Everything that was against us, the old law, the old covenant, the Ten Commandments, sin, sickness, death, everything was nailed to the cross of Calvary and rendered powerless. So when we hate something or fear something, you see, what are we doing? We're giving it a power. We're giving it a power. I give it no power whatsoever. I'm just neutral about it. You know, I've said there are three words that are connected with Knowledge of good and evil, love, hate, and fear. We love a good appearance. Hello. Oh, we love a good appearance. We love it when we have gone to a church and we've got the pins, you know. We have never missed a Sunday. Or we're, you know, an usher and we've been an usher for 55 years. We love a good appearance. We love people that come in and they just look good and... Uh, you know, they don't cuss and spit and chew or run with those that do. I mean, I'm not advocating that. I'm just simply saying we love a good appearance. We love a good appearance. But listen, it's not a good appearance. What I'm teaching is not about a good appearance. You know, the word hypocrite means an actor on the stage of life. Mm. <laughs> an actor on the stage of life. We've been actors in our religious days in, in the past, you see. We had that good appearance, and we looked good, you know, pompous and, you know, all in order, and like all of us like little penguins, you know, acting like one another and dressing like one another. And The church I came from, that's what they did. The women all had to have long hair. And I remember my husband, he got a, a leisure suit. Remember the leisure suits years ago? Oh, my mama just chewed him up one end down the other because he had a leisure suit. You don't wear a leisure jacket or a leisure shirt to church. You wear a suit. <laughs> Let me tell you. And I remember one time getting my hair cut because my hair is so thick and I look 20, 30 years older than what I really was. And I got my hair cut and I went to my mom's house and oh my gosh, I never heard the end of it for a long, long time. Simply because I got my hair trimmed up a little bit. <laughs> gotta look good <laughs> gotta look good in this church now you know people will look down on us if you're not following the rules mm -hmm. oh my God. can I tell you Jesus uh -huh. didn't keep the rules come on hello someone says well he fulfilled the law not by keeping it he fulfilled it by nailing to the cross. Yep. <laughs> hello he didn't fulfill it by keeping every jot and tittle let me, let me prove that to you how did he live he said, I don't do anything but what I see my father do. I don't say anything but what I hear my father say. He lived from the inside out. He did not keep an external set of rules and Ten Commandments. That's true. All right. He fulfilled it by nailing it to the cross, Colossians chapter 2 says. He took the handwriting of ordinances, everything that was against us, 
and he nailed it to the tree, rendering it powerless. Mm -hmm. So the way we live today is not by a set of external rules. We live from the inside out. We live by the Spirit. Amen. And the way we do that is we just simply, you know, we, we sow to the Spirit. Mm -hmm. We realize Whoa. that Christ is the source. Mm -hmm. We realize that he's finished the work and there's nothing more to do except for a people to realize and rest in what he's already done. Mm -hmm. Amen. Number Amen. seven, number seven, we must understand, I know some of these kind of flow into one another and they sound similar, but we must understand that the nature of God is not a power to fix anything that's wrong in the world or in a person's life. It is power in the sense that it maintains order and balance. For example, he upholds and sustains and maintains his kingdom on the inside of us. The sun automatically comes up in the morning. Did any of you get up this morning and pray that the sun come out? <laughs> or that the sun go down tonight son. no God just simply listen God is power in the sense that he maintains order and balance in the universe and he upholds and maintains and sustains his kingdom within us he stands behind his word he's not a man that he should lie he upholds his word but you see that is within us He uphold, where is the kingdom it comes not with observation it's within us it's righteousness peace and joy within us he upholds that kingdom he maintains that kingdom. He keeps order in that kingdom. But we must understand that God is not a power. See, he's omnipotent. That means he's all power. But not a power to overcome or fix something of a lesser power. He is power. And when we really understand God is power, he just is. He just is. He just is immortality, eternality, and incorruptibility. He just is that. And when you live out of the isness, there's nothing that has to be fixed in your life or anyone else's life or in this world. What we need to do is be like Brother Isaiah. See the whole earth full of the glory of God. That's walking by faith. And instead of looking at all, you know, the government, the corruptness, the price of this, that, and the other, let's be like Isaiah and see, live from the inside out or live by faith and see the whole earth full of the glory. See the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. And when we can walk by faith to that extent, then changes can take place out here. We can see things get in divine yeah. order. So number seven, we must understand that the nature of God is not a power to fix anything that's wrong in the world in our life or in someone else's life. Number eight, God is not something that we can use. We don't use God. Now, regarding the gifts of the Spirit, Paul the Apostle said, do not use the gifts as an occasion to the flesh. We don't use God. God is not our servant. I say that again. You cannot use God. God is not our servant. This is what Isaiah 40, 13 says. Who hath directed the Spirit of the Lord, or being his counselor, hath taught him? See, if we can command God, and use God, and even use truth to overcome something then what are we doing? We're using him. And what we're saying is, God, you're my servant. No, it's the other way around. We're the servants of God. We're sons with a servanthood attitude. See, So God's not our servant. God is not an entity to use. Truth is not an entity to use over something. Again, when Adam was told, have dominion in the garden, in the finished work, it wasn't have dominion over this, that, or the other. It was, you already have it. In other words, just enjoy the perfect environment and the perfect heredity. Just enjoy it. That's, yeah. that's what God meant when he said, Adam, have dominion. It wasn't having dominion over something. It wasn't a power over. No, he was already in. All he had to do was just have it, just enjoy it. It didn't say, Adam, you got to get or take dominion. That would be, that would be inferring, uh, take a dominion over something, exercise a, a power over something. But he said, no, just have it. And then when you get into Romans 5, 17, he says, we reign, not in the world, we reign in life. We reign in this perfect environment through the gift of righteousness and the abundance of grace. We reign in life, it says. So in other words, our reigning is not power over something. Our ruling is not ruling over something. Our having dominion is not taking or getting dominion. It is having it and ruling in life, enjoying who he is in this perfect environment and perfect heredity. It's rest and realizing. That's what it is. Yep. Number nine, 
This is another biggie for a lot of people. You cannot influence God by begging, beseeching, praying, fasting, tithing. Hello. Now, I'm for all those things, but not to get more righteous. We do those things because we are already righteous. He is our righteousness. But you can't influence God by any of those things. God is not a God to be influenced. And until people see that, they're nowhere. Except still begging and commanding and decreeing and declaring and binding and loosing and affirming and all of that stuff that we were taught to do in that holy place dimension. You know, and I'm not saying that that didn't work at times, but here's the question. Was it fruit that remained? No. We were, you know, we'd get healed one day. Next day we'd be sick or a month or a year. We'd get a great financial blessing and maybe be broke in a month or two. It wasn't lasting. See, what our Father is after is a people to live from the inside out to where everything that they experience of the kingdom of God is perpetual. It never ends. It's fruit that remains. It's continuing fruit, as John 15 says. It's a perpetuity of who God is in through and as us. It's not having it one day and losing it the next. See, and listen, the world is looking for a people of consistency that they can look upon. How does a scripture say that they'll know us? By our fruit. But not fruit that's here today and gone tomorrow. Fruit that remains, remaining fruit. So number nine, you cannot influence God. No matter how you try, what you do, you can never influence God. He's already finished the work and given you all things that pertain to life and godliness. He's already blessed us with all spiritual blessings in the heavenlies. Given us all things that pertain to life, natural life, and godliness, spiritual life. We lack nothing. Why? Yeah. Because he has no lack. And he is all in all. Salvation, sozo in the Greek, it means nothing broken, nothing missing. Nothing broken. Nothing missing. So that tells me I'm already in a perfect environment with a perfect heredity, so I just need to have dominion in there. Just, just, have, just, 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 have, just live it. Just, just, just enjoy, yes, sir. Just enjoy. Just enjoy it. Number 10, last one. There is nothing personal about the activity of God in the sense that he would do anything more for me than he would for you. I had a lady in my church in Portland years ago say, well, if Kay Fairchild doesn't get healed, how can I expect to ever get healed? What? <gasps> what? <laughs> the rain falls in the just and the unjust. And I tell the people all the time, if a person has more finances or more clothes or more house or whatever than you do, you cannot be one iota jealous over them because you have the same allness on the inside of you. And you can't take away yeah. from allness and you can't add to allness. All is all, you see. So there's no need for anyone to be jealous over what someone has in a material sense because we all have the same potentiality on the inside of us. All of us have the same on the inside of us. There are no exceptions to the divine law of God. Why? There's neither male nor female, Jew nor Greek, bond nor free. We're all one in Christ Jesus, and he is all in all. In every per He lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Everyone has the same potential. Whether they recognize it or not, they have the same potential on the inside of them. Every person. Sure. Every person. God is not, you know, he tells us not to be partial. So you think he is? <laughs> he ain't partial. He's given every man, blessed every man with the same. Every man has all already. Every man on the face of this earth. Now, that was the nature of God. Let me give you a few things on the nature of error and a few things on the nature of prayer, and then I'll close. Nature of error. I didn't give you a handout for this. Maybe I'll bring you one next week. But the world believes that error is a problem or is a power in the world. The world believes that error is a power causing all the problems that we see in the world. Mm -hmm. The nature of error, according to 2 Chronicles 32, 8, I already quoted from Hezekiah, the nature of error is an arm of flesh. Mm -hmm. Isaiah 40 said, it is nothing, mm -hmm. less than nothing. Why? Because Jesus eradicated it. Matthew 5.39 says, resist not evil. We're not to resist evil. We're not to fight it because anything you fight, you give power to. What are we to do? We're to rest in what Jesus did to it. 
Now, I, I brought a big one up on Sunday evening. All of this Ebola, so-called Ebola epidemic. Can I tell you, germs have no power. Come on. But now listen. Those people need to gear up and wash their hands and protect themselves if they don't have the consciousness that Jesus took care of all that at the cross of Calvary. They need to protect themselves. But I'm just saying, when we live from the inside out, we really are establishing what Jesus did at the cross of Calvary. Germs don't have any power. Sickness doesn't have any power. None of that has any power. Only the power we give it. Now, we can give anything a power. But in and of itself, sin, sickness, death, corruption, none of that has any power in and of itself other than the power we give it by believing that it has a power. Right. Darkness, what is that? The absence of light. The absence of light. Sickness, the absence of the consciousness that he is the immortality of my body. Evil, 1 Thessalonians 5.22 says we are to shun, shrink back, abstain from every, listen, appearance of evil. So, Paul the Apostle is calling evil simply an appearance. With no power except the power that we would give it by thinking that it had a power. Now, that's the nature of error. In a nutshell, everything that was against us, Jesus nailed to the cross of Calvary. Everything that Adam released by partaking of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, Jesus nailed to the tree, thank God, rendering it totally powerless. It has no power in and of itself although we can give it a power by not having this realization and this quickening within us. Then, the nature of prayer. Let me give you a few things in closing on the nature of prayer. Prayer, then, is no longer merely words from our memory bank or just from thoughts, even though we may have the scriptures memorized. If it's just a thought out of the memory bank <coughs> and it hasn't gotten into our consciousness, now when I say power, I don't mean a power over something, because thoughts, really, there's really not a true power just on thoughts. The power is on consciousness, and that's how God created. The power is on the awareness and the consciousness. But again, not a power to exercise over a lesser power, power to be. Remember when they were in Acts and they received the endowment from on high? It doesn't say that they received the power from on high to go out and do something. It said to be. So we are empowered to be who we be, to live out of the nowness of God. That's what the power is for, not to try to overcome a lesser power. We are empowered to be, just to be. And someone brought up tonight about going out and witnessing. The best way we can go out and witness is just be, yeah, just on. be, just be. Because most of the time we're just giving them our concepts and ideas about mm -hmm. our Father. You can't give them an experience, but we can just be and they can desire to be what we be to live out of that dimension. They'll be drawn to us like a magnet. Mm -hmm. So no longer prayer, the nature of prayer is no longer just words and thoughts, but must come out of consciousness. Not by might, mental might, not by physical and material power, but by my spirit or consciousness, saith the Lord. Mm -hmm. It's not asking to do something. It's not even having a desire or expecting something because all things are already done and they are on the inside of us. The only thing that I expect, the only desire I have is like Paul the Apostle, I want to know him. Not just know about him, I want to know him intimately. That's what Paul said. I'm like, Paul, you don't know him? You wrote over two-thirds of the New Testament? No, he said that I would know him and the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, being made conformable unto his death. In other words, I'm going to know him through what he already did at the cross of Calvary and who he is in me, through me, and as me. Prayer is a state of silence, in which we become receptive to the still small voice on the inside of us. Prayer is not beseeching a power to destroy or overcome something, but it is prayer is becoming conscious of one power, one presence, and one mind. Prayer is seeing the whole earth full of the glory, regardless of how it looks and appears. Prayer is seeing the earth as the Lord's in the fullness thereof. That's true prayer. That's true prayer. It's just realizing it's just resting prayer is communing prayer is fellowship prayer is letting the thoughts the outer thoughts be still and taking no thought for food drink and so forth as jesus said in matthew 6 but prayer is simply seeking to live from the inside out
seeking to know him more. Prayer is communion. Prayer is fellowship. Prayer is silence. Prayer is not words that we speak. Now it used to be, and let me just say again, God honored that to some degree. We did a lot of begging and commanding and demanding. And he honored that too. You know, he, mm -hmm. he's not winking at our ignorance today. He wants us to live out of the most holy place, not Amen. out of the outer court experience of the holy place anymore. Amen. He, you know, we were all paideons and paises. What is that? A toddler. An infant and a toddler. Pais is an infant and, and paideon is a toddler. Mm -hmm. Technon, the word that's used for sons is the adolescent teenage realm. And how many know you can't tell a teenager hardly anything? Yeah. They know it all. Right? Mm -hmm. But then Helios is the matured son. Romans 8 says that the Helios son, mm -hmm. the awakened son, lives by the Spirit of God. They live from the inside out. So prayer is primarily silence, mm -hmm. just waiting to hear the still small voice. And then if you're inclined and led of the Spirit within to speak the words that you hear from the still <laughs> small voice, then when he utters his voice, the earth melts. Things begin to happen. And again, it's not so much that something changes. You know, you flip on the light in a dark room, where does the darkness go? Well, it, it doesn't go anywhere. It's nothing. But there is, on one level, there is a dissolving of that. There is a swallowing up of that. And so when we really begin to see that nothing really needs to change because of who he is in us and as us, then we'll begin to experience some what we would call change because it appears like things change when a pain goes or you know love dissolves or something it appears that something changed but really it's just christ being revealed mm. just like the light is just being revealed when you mm. flip on the light yeah. switch in a dark room christ cool. is just re the light is just revealed and the darkness goes nowhere but it appears to go somewhere right to our senses you see to our senses so what have we said tonight we've simply said thoughts and words are not the end all. We've got to move beyond just the thoughts. Thoughts are what? They are an agency to consciousness, to awareness. They're a realization or they're a, they're a vehicle to a realization. They are an, a, a thought giving the Holy Spirit an opportunity to quicken it in our heart or in our consciousness. Because as a man thinketh in his consciousness, in his heart, so is he, or so will be his experience. It has to come from the inside out, not from the outside in. So moving beyond mere words and thoughts. And once we really get gripped by that realization and that revelation, it'll change everything about our lives. Christ will be revealed in reality. And we will live, we will pray differently, we will look at appearances differently. Everything will be different. Our perception will be totally different. Amen. Our awareness will be completely different. Yes. And thank God for that because, listen, for too long we have lived in the confusion, Babylon, the confusion <laughs> of religiosity, not knowing which end was up or down. What are we to do? And listen to that. But thank God now there's a word coming forth with clarity. Amen. A seventh trump, a clear-sounding word is coming forth. Yes. And listen, once that trumpet implodes on the inside of you, Amen. I guarantee you, you will be, experientially, you will be a living epistle known and read of all men. People will look at you and they'll see the fruit. And it won't be fruit that's here today and gone tomorrow. It'll be fruit that remains. There'll be a consistency there. Amen. So, Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for this people that are hungering and thirsting to know you in a greater way than they've ever known and experienced you before. Thank you for your word and thank you for the Holy Spirit, the true teacher, that as we just contemplate and meditate, you will just by your presence, you will quicken these realities to us and we'll be able to experience them and walk in them. Every eye will see the Christ in the earth. We thank you, we praise you in the name of the Lord. Amen, amen, and amen.